Matias Home Gathering, sejam bem-vindos. Hoje viajamos no tempo. Ficaremos a conhecer uma formação criada há 15 anos e já com o intuito de preparar atores da mudança e líderes da sustentabilidade. Trata-se de um mestrado e onde é que isto tudo começou? Alexandra Lichtenberg, muito boa tarde. Boa tarde, João. Isso tudo começou na Suécia e hoje nós vamos conversar com a diretora atual desse programa, que chama... Strategic Leadership Towards Sustainability uh, no Blacking Institute of Technology e com alguns ex-alunos. O Ben Neppers, que fundou a Bureo no Chile, no Chile. o Richard Key Blumen, que trabalha há mais de 12 anos, iniciativas muito importantes aqui na Europa. E, e ainda temos uma... Uma pequena surpresa para o final, mas já lá vamos. <risos> certo. Vamos então uh, dar início à conversa uh, com uh, vários participantes deste mestrado, a começar uh, pela responsável por este programa uh, de mestrado, a doutora Marlena Messimer. Hi, and thanks for joining our uh, conversation. You had the, uh, this uh, master's degree. Um, and it's a program that has created uh, various sustainability leaders But my question is, how do you prepare your students um, and how do you turn your students into agents of change? Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, I would say we don't turn our students into agents of change. It's their own uh, journey. Uh, but I think what we help them with is to give them both a strategic approach to sustainability, so a way of working with sustainability that takes the big picture into consideration and helps them be most effective when they're working on the ground. And then also we help them train their own leadership skills uh, that they already come with. Um, but I think the program that we offer is for many a place to enhance their leadership skills and also to find like-minded people. And this focus on the business dimension, but does it also um, pay attention to government level? Because we need both of them. Yes, so the approach that we use isn't specific to a sector. Um, you could use it on business, you can use it on governance, you could use it with a municipality, with a nonprofit organization. And I think it's very important that we need all of those pieces uh, and all of those levels. Um, and I think one of the things that the program does is bring together people from those different backgrounds. So it's intentionally very diverse um, so that people can learn from different perspectives. And we also discuss all of those perspectives in the program. In your doctorate uh, research, you have developed five sustainability principles. What are them? Yes, so my doctorate was on the social sustainability dimension. Uh, and the idea being that often we have more strategic approaches and more um, systematic work on the ecological side, but that we really also need that on the social side. So that's what my doctorate was on. Uh, and I developed uh, five different principles for social sustainability. Um, I can list them if you want. They're, the language is very specific, but it's about the structural barriers or the structural obstacles that people face in society. So the first one is around structural obstacles to health. Uh, the second one around structural obstacles to influence the system. Uh, the third one is around structural obstacles to competence. So being able to develop themselves and within a group of society. Uh, structural obstacles to impartiality. So being treated equally and fairly. And structural obstacles to meaning making. And are so these idea... being applied in projects worldwide? Uh, yes. So we train our students in the approach, but we also do research projects, um, mostly in Europe, I would say, but the students often take the approach with them and then apply it in different sectors. So I'm often in touch with many different students from across the world who want to more support in how to apply it in their work, um, be it in business or governance or municipal work. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Merlina Missimer. I want to uh, now address uh, another student of uh, this, this program, who is now in Chile um, and trying to uh, help protect uh, the oceans. And my question is, how does an American, young and American engineer, uh, uh, travels to Sweden to have a, a master's degree and then ends up in, in Chile uh, working to protect our oceans? 
<laughs> yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, first off, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here today. Um, I mean, honestly, it actually started even before that. I worked in a refugee settlement in, in Zambia, um, did uh, research and development in a biomedical company in Ireland. Um, so it's been pretty well through my life to travel and experience the world. But um, it's a long story, so I'll do my best to summarize. Um, really what, what took me there um, was this passion for sustainability. Um, before this program, um, I was simply a mechanical engineering student um, studying my undergraduate in Boston and got introduced um, to this, this master's program and, and it just really opened my eyes and, and brought me into this incredible field that um, is my life's work. And uh, that is, is combating this, this sustainability challenge we're facing today. Um, to speed things up, I, I finished the program, got some incredible opportunities to work as a, a sustainability consultant in New Zealand and in Australia, and it actually eventually led me to working in, for the Chilean government for um, a nonprofit organization called uh, Fundacion Chile. Um, when I got to Chile, I was really struck by two things. Um, one, an incredible coastline that was still very untouched, and two, um, tremendous support for entrepreneurs. Um, the Startup Chile program in particular is a really um, supportive uh, network of entrepreneurs coming to Chile to want to start a business from scratch. And really what I did is relay that to some, some dear friends from, from the past. And, and we thought, hey, what if we could combine our skill sets, one in finance, one in engineering design, and myself in sustainability, to take on something we were really passionate about, which was the ocean environment. And when we were coming across again and again in all of our surf travels and, and just experiences in this space, the problem of plastic pollution plaguing it, we thought there has to be something more that can be done. And what it eventually led us to today is setting up a business that's now operating across Chile, Peru, and Argentina um, that works together to, um, with the fishing industry to combat um, what's now recognized as the most harmful form of ocean plastic pollution being discarded fishing nets. A single net being left in the ocean, it's designed to trap marine life, can last over 500 years. And uh, what we do is we work together with those fisheries to um, give them the resources, the education and training uh, to now collect back those nets at its most vulnerable state when they don't have other options to, to discard them. And instead we incentivize them to return them to us where we can now transform into a high value raw material source where we're partnering with a growing list of companies that are utilizing it as a raw material to phase out the use of virgin plastic and instead substitute it with our material that's now known as net plus plastic. And the biggest partnership to date has been with really our, our guiding light in this, this field um, is Patagonia. Um, so the first product we launched just this year um, is now every hat brim, something you don't really think about. The plastic in all hat brims around the world is, has always been made from virgin plastic and we've now working with Patagonia, have switched it over to 100% recycled fishing that's sourced through our program. But this is really just the start for us. We're looking forward to doing a lot more and finding a lot more solutions for this material. And do you think the fact that you've had this contact with, with different continents, different realities, helps you have a, a much more global approach to what you do? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that. Um, I, I certainly... Um, I'm not uh, hesitant at all to uh, knock on someone's door to go up to a new fishing village, wherever it may be, uh, even as a gringo. And, and uh, just, just it gives you a lot of, um, I guess, confidence and, and just um, to understand that um, we're all the same. No matter where we grew up, uh, we're all human beings. We all want to make this world a better place. And I think that's, that's definitely given me a lot of faith in, in the potential we have to continue creating more positive solutions for the world. Thank you, Ben. I'm um, grabbing a few comments from Alexandra. Um, é, João, um comentários uh, estas intervenções é, é interessante notar que esse, essa abordagem ensinada no mestrado é, começou a ser desenvolvida 30 anos atrás por um médico um oncologista que estava uh, se incomodando muito e queria entender as causas da insustentabilidade crescente do planeta. E ele reuniu uns 50 outros cientistas e várias iterações e chegaram a um consenso 
uh, com quatro princípios de sustentabilidade, que se seguidos podem levar qualquer organização no caminho da sustentabilidade. É, o que, que ele fez? Ele resolveu que ele tinha que disseminar isso. Ele fez um vídeo, livretos, e com o apoio do rei da Suécia, ele distribuiu para a população inteira da Suécia. Não foi aqui ou ali, todos. Então, isso é, é criar conscientização da população. O mestrado foi criado em 2005, hoje nós somos mais de 600 ex-alunos em 80 países diferentes. Então, quando você olha para todo essa, essa, esse trabalho, eu acho que não é coincidência que uma Greta Thunberg surgiu na Suécia, né? Há uma certa mudança de mentalidade, obviamente, a diferentes níveis no mundo. Se calhar agora falamos com outro ex-aluno, com o Richard Bloom. Um, Thanks for joining us. You're also a former graduate of this uh, program. You've worked in the, the natural step in, in Stockholm. You have been a uh, participant in many transformational uh, projects. But can you tell us uh, about what you feel is the most iconic project you've worked in? Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, great to be here. Um, I can share something about the project I've been uh, involved in pretty much the whole time I've been at the natural step. And it's uh, a project within the European plastics sector that started over 20 years ago. So it's probably one of the longest running change initiatives in our network, and many people have contributed to it over the years. Um, actually, it's probably really more of a series of uh, initiatives that have built on each other over time. And it all started with a gap analysis where the natural step was asked to look at PVC as a material and try and define what it would need to Uh, what challenges it would need to be overcome in order for it to have a place in a sustainable future. And they're basically the methods I learned about in this sustainability master's program. Uh, so since uh, that uh, initial gap analysis of PVC as a, a plastic, uh, it's expanded into uh, programs helping companies uh, to embed these challenges into their strategies and their operations. Uh, it's led to um, supply chain engagement to try and get suppliers on board with the, the work those companies are doing. It's even led to an industry-wide training program uh, for industry leaders in those companies. And that's actually something that was together run uh, with the university again in Blaking uh, Institute of Technology in Sweden. So what we have now actually is that since all those initiatives are built on each other, Uh, we've got to a point where now the entire value chain are united in a 10-year roadmap, uh, which is known as Vinyl Plus. And uh, essentially, the industry has got this, uh, this roadmap ahead of them on how they want to uh, solve their challenges and aim towards a vision where they can be part of a sustainable future. Uh, so, and I mean, it's quite exciting to see that it's pretty much the whole of the European PVC industry that are connected in this. It's over 200 companies and uh, all parts of the value chain from the resin producers to the, those making the additives to people making PVC products and even then having an entire uh, recycling network right across Europe. And um, do you feel proud of, of having participated in something that started somewhat in a micro level and that which has evolved to a very uh, um, macro level, let's put it this way. Uh, definitely. I think it's sometimes hard to see uh, the effect until later, and you look back in hindsight and then see how all of these things have cumulatively built up. And obviously, like I said, it's a lot, a lot of people have been involved, and uh, I don't think any one person can take credit for what's been achieved. Uh, but it, is, it does uh, feel positive to see the, the results over, over a long period of time. And be, to be able to sort of evaluate that. And, you know, it is, it is cumulative. So you can see now the volumes of recycling, you can see the changes in the chemical formulations that are being used in uh, PVC. Uh, you can see it in the design of new product labels, um, tools to assess additives, all sorts of things. And uh, this is also something that is very much uh, really on the European policy agenda. And this initiative that I'm referring to, Vinyl Plus, is seen as one of the leading initiatives about trying to get the plastics industry to be part of the circular economy in Europe. Thank you, Richard. I'm heading back to the studio. Um, Alexandra, era aquilo que falávamos no início. A, a surpresa é o facto de Alexandra também ter feito 
parte deste, deste mestrado e em que projetos é que esteve envolvido, ou, ou pelo menos quais foram os trabalhos que, de alguma forma, marcaram mais? João, eu sou arquiteta e urbanista e desenhei a primeira casa sustentável do Brasil. Por que eu digo que a primeira? Porque quando ela terminou, terminou a obra, eu falei, como é que eu vou saber se ela é sustentável? Eu fui fazer um mestrado para poder monitorar e medir o desempenho das iniciativas implementadas. Então, isso é muito importante. Mas, é, depois disso, eu achei que ainda estava faltando alguma coisa. É, eu tinha ouvido falar desse mestrado, eu uh, tinha lido sobre esses princípios da sustentabilidade, que eu queria saber mais. Acabei indo parar na Suécia, 2007, 2008, e isso abriu muito a, a minha perspectiva. É, em, o meu campo de atuação e quando eu voltei para o Brasil tive a oportunidade de trabalhar em projetos icônicos é, um deles foi uh, um projeto para Rio Mais 20 12 multinacionais é, se uniram para entender como os seus produtos e serviços poderiam melhorar a qualidade de vida de duas comunidades do Rio de Janeiro duas favelas e isso envolveu as multinacionais, governo, academia, as comunidades, um trabalho muito perto das comunidades e com resultados excelentes. Um outro projeto foi o desenvolvimento de políticas públicas para construção sustentável em Belo Horizonte. Também multi-stakeholder, envolvendo muita gente, para entender o sistema e poder entender onde devemos atuar nesse sistema para atingir os objetivos. Aquilo que notamos eh, da conversa que temos tido ao longo deste episódio é que, de facto, este acaba por ser um, um programa de formação com uma vocação internacional eh, assinalável, porque eh, ouvimos aqui o caso do Ben, ouvimos também o caso do, do Richard, o seu caso, porque é brasileira, eh, estudou também na Suécia, eh, eh, está por cá... Eh, eh, este, o facto da Suécia acabar por capitalizar esta ou atrair, digamos assim, esta, esta vocação internacional, acaba por mostrar que ainda também é, é, falta algum caminho para é, é, tornar os países em exemplos semelhantes, digamos assim. É, João, eu acho que enfim, a cada país, cada continente é, consegue trazer as iniciativas possíveis. A União Europeia está fazendo um esforço excelente, maravilhoso, na minha opinião. O que você pode ver dessas narrativas, é, o que elas têm em comum, é que todas é, lidam com o sistema. Elas é, procuram entender o sistema onde elas estão agindo, onde o negócio está inserido entender os stakeholders, para poder elaborar em conjunto estratégias sustentáveis de curto, médio e longo prazo. É, não, e não uh, olhando para as causas raízes do problema, e não para os sintomas, porque com sintomas você traz soluções rápidas que não são duradouras. Então, é, é muito importante olhar para isso, Digamos, por exemplo, que eu seja, você tem que olhar o cerne do seu negócio. Digamos que eu seja uma empresa de óleo e gás. É, eu, não adianta eu, por exemplo, colocar as minhas instalações no edifício sustentável. Isso não traz impacto em relação ao meu negócio. Eu tenho que realmente elaborar uma estratégia para fazer a transição, para continuar sendo uma empresa de energia, mas no campo das renováveis. É... E isso não pode ser visto como um custo, isso é um investimento, porque isso traz retorno financeiro e muito retorno financeiro. Eu vou, se calhar, dar as conclusões finais, a oportunidade das conclusões finais à doutora Marlina Messimer. Um, doctor, um, do you think we were discussing the international aspect of this master's degree in, in, in specific, but do you think the world needs more master's program like yours? Uh, absolutely. Well, I think we all know that the sustainability challenge that we have is so massive that we need as many people as possible. So I think the more people we can get on board, the more people who feel like they can create sy systemic solutions, um, I think that's a good thing. So there's no way that we could uh, 
educate enough people in every year to make that happen. So the more, the better. Thank you so much. I want to thank uh, all of my guests, uh, Dr. Merlinda Missimer, um, Ben Nampers and uh, Richard Bloom. Uh, thank you for participating in this debate. Alexandra Lichtenberg, muito obrigado pela sua presença neste, neste debate e também pela experiência que partilhou sobre este programa de mestrado. É todo o tempo que temos. Uh, fica concluído mais um encontro de Planeteers Home Gathering. Até breve. Thank you.